There are several things humanity is going to have to do if we plan on surviving the collapse of our star. Exhibited all throughout human history, our innate curiosity of places around us, specifically on this rock known as Earth, where we have been confined to, have explored, discovered, and moved about the planet, virtually conquering the whole thing if you really think about it. The only place we really do not seemingly want to go is the bottom of the ocean, where the wretched abomination known as the anglerfish is down there. Actually, editor, put one of those things up on screen. Look at this thing. It honestly sickens me that I have to be on this planet with it. Kill it with fire. Like, I'm not saying it should be bullied for existing, but everyone is always like, oh, it's only three feet long. No, the largest one to have been seen is six feet long, or really around two meters, and weighed around 180 pounds, which is about 81.6 kilograms. Gross. All right, where was I? I asked. So, we're starting with the anglerfish slander early today, but anyhow, if we plan on leaving this planet and with it the horrific creatures of the ocean behind, we will need to get our space program in order a little more clearly. Past that, we will need to learn how to exist on other planets, and to that end, arguably our largest hurdle is achieving a speed fast enough allowing us to actually leave our solar system and not take, like, thousands of years to get to the closest star, Proxima Centauri, which is only about four light years away, but with our current tech, it's a lot like how ancient man probably used canoes to traverse the open ocean. A lot of time was spent, and a lot of people didn't make it. There are many hypotheses out there and ideas on how to achieve either close to light speed or faster than light speed, but the reality is often disappointing. First, even if we did achieve close to light speed, because fundamentally it's impossible for man to travel at the speed of light because we're made of matter, it would still take years to get to where we need to go, and even to that end, the galaxy is like 100,000 light years across, so we aren't going to be doing that very easily. But the concept of creating portals of sorts has always been enticing. Of course, it starts getting into some pretty strange physics once you actually do. It operates on the principle that our reality can be torn. We can leave this universe and use the other side of whatever is out there to traverse vast distances. And I'm pretty sure humans achieve this in the year 40,000, and it then kickstarts a bunch of issues with the warp travel, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, interestingly, much like our ideas concerning portal travel, we tend to think that there is something on the other side that could be malevolent waiting for us. In the events of Doom Annihilation, this is true. As humanity stumbled across portals on the Martian moon Phobos, they would build a base with the intention of using the portal for whatever its purpose is, which is basically to be a portal. Thanks for sticking with me through that, I know, it was, it was a tough one. But as humanity would do no animal testing for some reason, which is totally unlike us, they would then send humans through, which appeared to induce physiological changes to the body. And it was also an absolute detriment to the human mind and body. But why exactly was this the case, and how did it happen? Let's discuss that in today's episode over Doom Annihilation. But first, I'm sponsored by a game that I actually do play. You already know how it goes, player. Player, because you're going to be the one playing the game. So every time I do a raid integration, I get people who mention how I don't play it. They actually do. But there's also this misconception that it has like no depth or doesn't take any strategy. First, you can literally play this game for years due to the amount of content and never get bored. Along with constant updates, what's already in there, such as like 800 heroes, PVE, PVP, CVC, artifacts, clan bosses, the cursed city with over 100 stages to complete, the argument that there's really nothing to do has always seemed a little disingenuous to me. And more like people being like, oh, it's what social media told me to feel. So I personally am playing it because like, I like grinding and building new champions to build them as like strong as they can be. And like another misconception that I've always seen is it's pay to win. Typically with any game that's free, yes, there's gonna be those who wanna progress faster. So yeah, you can pay if you'd like, or do what I do, which is just don't do that. Even content creators who focus on raid content specifically are free to play channels, and their champions are pretty much brick houses. And again, I mean, that's how I play the game. Currently, Raid is also celebrating a new lunar year, with its lunar festival complete with events, tournaments, summon boosts, and more. So, see, there's even more to do. If you haven't started playing yet, and all this sounds acceptable to you, then by clicking the link in the description or scanning my QR code, you'll get insane bonuses only by my link. You will immediately get 500k silver, energy, and chicken, and then the epic champion Juliana after reaching level 15. She is a boss killer and an attack type warrior wielding magic affinity, thus very powerful against enemies with affinity. So, come find under the name Roanoke, join my clan Croatoan, and we will be legends together. So just hit the link in my description, and I'll see you on the battlefield. We kick off our story with the knowledge that I have covered the original Doom movie, but don't be a nerd, I love covering these things. We are at Mars, hopefully something I will see humans do in my lifetime, but given current events, it's much more likely we'll just nuke each other into oblivion like a bunch of stupid apes. Yeehaw, brother! As the moon Phobos floats by, a base is set up to conduct experiments, having found the portals that we should definitely use with reckless abandon because uh, we're human and this is our solar system. Dr. Bertridge, Buttridge, Bertridge, whatever, walks by as he heads into the portal room. 
They're all pretty jazzed as they will be testing out Portal Tech that day. Back on Earth in Nevada, a volunteer is getting ready to go through. He is honored to have been chosen for this task. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that one, but I suppose intelligence does not automatically equate to non-gullibility. And there's a song that I'd like to sing to you about rather than using human life first and foremost, we have done it before and we can do it again. Monkeys in outer space, protecting the freedom of the human race. Many died along the way. In fact, they all did, but that's okay. Why would you not send several plants at first and then animals to see the effects before sending a literal human? I don't know, maybe even fly a drone in there, seeing how it reacts to human tissue first. Bit of an oversight, one would think, but uh, you don't advance in science with standard thinking, brother. So as the good doctor approaches the portal, he heads in, and immediately you can hear him screaming if you listen hard enough. Well, you can't, but I can. All you can hear is me yapping. So, emerging on the other side, everyone is super jazzed about it. Now, the thing about this concept of portals is, uh, well, there's quite a few ideas, but it's sort of like being knocked unconscious, right? Portals are said to disassemble you and then reassemble you on the other side at an atomic level, meaning all physiological functions cease momentarily. Which is great, but then are you still the same person? If you are knocked unconscious and have your continuous stream of consciousness interrupted, when it comes back, are you the same person? These are more philosophical questions, it remains the same. Also, the concept of being disassembled atom by atom has to be incredibly painful for the first few seconds, and then you have to wonder uh, if it's going to properly put you back together again. When he emerges, everyone is, again, super happy about his return, not bothering to check if, uh, you know, he's not human super or anything. I mean, those organs could be nothing but slop at this point. Anyhow, that's right up until they look at him and see blood has turned black in his eyes, and he has completely lost his mind. His fingernails have grown, and the alarm begins warning the scientists that something is wrong. Yeah, that's what happens when you uh, have problems with portals. To physically transport, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. Ergo, when you emerge almost instantly on this side, you have to exit the universe itself. With that being the case, where did you go? How long did you spend outside of the universe with the laws of physics being different? Because it could be a second, a month, a decade. It's really hard to say because what happens on the outside of space-time of this universe could equate to seconds here, being the feeling of years outside of our usual playmate laws. So we see the first physiological changes to the human meat suit, and interestingly, as will become clear, we need to operate with the idea that humans have souls, which I operate with that line of thinking all the time, so it won't be too much of a stretch for me, but it might be for you. You believe what you want to believe. So clear your mind for a moment, and just connect with the idea that we are about to discuss that. Given that humans have souls and doom annihilation confirmed, this would highlight the fundamental difference between matter and energy. The body itself is matter, one form in the universe. The soul, being pure energy, is another. For us to exist as is, they would need to be linked in a relationship that colors the life of a person. By removing one while the other goes on, we're going to have to sort of look at this as like a soul corruption or the complete absence of a soul in general, specifically when the doctor emerges. Again, they have no idea how long he's been there, but if we look at the clues of the body, such as the elongated fingernails, it appears he's been gone for quite some time. So we can start to piece together what is going on with those who cross over through the portal. As we all know, hell energy lies on the other side, and with that energy, energy can be corrupted, or at least it alters. Sort of like, for instance, if you take uh, a wavelength, right, and another wavelength comes at it, it can either combine to form a larger wavelength, or it's got destructive, what is it, constructive interference versus destructive interference, where it cancels each other out. Essentially, wavelengths of energy can alter other wavelengths of energy. And I know I'm sounding like a crystal chick right now, but that's that's actually physics. So what is left over is your body no longer connected to the original soul, but instead dealing with the energetic wavelengths of hell energy. As we all know with demons, the hell energy has the capability to reanimate them, indicating that much like the marker in dead space, hell energy reanimates cells and now serves as to stand in the way of metabolism of sorts, rather than just like your standard oxygen-based one, which again is why former humans can exist outside in the vacuum of space and humans cannot. It's because the energy of hell is keeping them alive. They are no longer oxygen-based. But this is just preliminary thinking. With the soul gone or corrupted by hell energy, which I just have a propensity to think it's completely gone given what we will see later, the body itself shows physical signs of change due to foundational changes. Removing the soul would be like removing any other organ if you can think about it. The body would have difficulty maintaining itself. However, the hell energy keeps the body alive, which in turn allows it to still display the physical detriments of a lost soul, which is usually death itself, but remain functional and controlled. Basically, uh, you're undead and you're walking around, at least just your body is, and that's why like when you drop and then you look the way you look, I mean obviously we know it's because of the breakdown of our actual bodies due to bacteria, but 
it's making a pass the concept that once your soul is gone, your body then undergoes natural deterioration like this. It's just now the hell energy is there to keep you alive. But there are things that remain functional and controlled, such as like your physical structure and your muscle. The brain is probably still in there to a degree, but with the soul gone, it's like an old couple moving out of a house and then renting it out to a fraternity who parties all the time. The entire feel of the place is going to change. So next we end up with Joan having a dream about her mother. Waking up, she exits her sleeping pod from stasis as the computer reminds her to uh, drink some water, about 200 fluid ounces, I believe. They're aboard the NOLA heading towards Phobos. The team is starting to wake up and they all appear to be having some issues and the showers don't even work and that's gotta be completely wonderful after a four month sleep. I'm sure everyone just smells absolutely amazing. Meeting the team, Lee is talking about how someone basically went through her underwear and it was missing and I break away to say if you look like Lee, hit me up. So it's the general ribbing and ball busting type of deal until Joan comes in and then the whole team just gets up and walks off. Ah yes, socially that has to feel great. My man Stone over here dated Joan like four months, uh, or four four months, ten years ago, and he still has the hots for her. My brother in Christ, it may be time to move on. As they continue their approach, Dr. Bertridge has a call with a board member about his findings, and they have a disagreement over the portal. The board doctor is concerned about the psychosis being displayed and wants the project shut down. Realizing he's on borrowed time, Dr. Bertridge, Bertridge, God, I gotta get this dude's name right, says he will be the one entering the portal next, and as a result, they won't need to find another volunteer. Bro, use a chimp. Did you not hear the song that I just sang? Or like a grasshopper, or something, anything but human. And then you give like the chimp armoring or something, like a magnetic field on its armor, and just keep using stuff until you find out exactly what is causing a person to exhibit psychosis. Although, a chimp that hulks out due to Argent energy exposure does not sound like a great idea either, let alone an armored chimp. You know what, maybe, maybe just raw dog the portal, Dr. Bertridge. Forget I said anything. Heading back over to the NOLA, they discuss how a Martian day is called a soul. Why? <laughs> like, S-O-L, that's the name of our son, right? Which S-O-L is kind of, that's kind of funny. Anyway. Anyways, so like, you called it a Martian day, just called a Martian day, but no, we don't do that around here, partner. So they discuss how they're being stationed there for three years and how upset the team is. Essentially, Joan was insubordinate, which resulted in the entire team being punished. The captain then yells at Winslow saying, you don't think I could find you worse places to work roll tide if you don't shut up? And he sounds just like that. I mean, Winslow, you did sign up for this. Did you think you're going to be laying on beaches talking to beautiful women all day? People in the military actually sound off on this. Uh, did you think you'd be stationed somewhere fun? Does that exist? Surely not. I feel like it's always just you being stationed in Minot, North Dakota or something like that. Back at Phobos, Bertrand gets a brain scan to make sure there's nothing in his system, as they said there was something in the original guy's system, which is why he may have had that freak out. Cope of the century. So as he gets ready to enter the portal, they then fire that bad boy up. While that's going on, the captain talks about how when he gets to Phobos, he's resigning. Also, if you weren't aware, the lore here is that the original Doom Marine was ordered to force multiply civilians by his sergeant. Instead, he blood punched the sergeant and was punished by being sent to Mars as it totally sucked out there. So that's the connection with Joan. Don't worry, there's about to be a ton of these references. The fan service of this movie legitimately was top notch, even if the budget was only like $4 and a bit of shoestring. So back to the portals we go. Turning on the portal, Dr. Buttridge enters, and then an electrical field is sent out, shutting down the facility. As one woman goes to grab the med kit, she turns around hearing something growling and then screams. Player two has entered the game. The NOLA is now landing on the pad and is met with absolute silence. Never heard of a system-wide blackout from a busted comms array before. Daisy the AI calls out as well, but nobody responds. That said, Martian Command reaches out and tells them that they have a developing situation and to stand by for mission specs, which is not a good sign. So the captain gets everyone together as Dr. Stone tells them of an emergency entrance and what luck. They literally have perfectly already lined up with a hatch. What are the odds? 20 minutes ago, the facility went dark. They then play the audio and can hear screaming and growling. Also not a good sign, unless you like screaming and growling, in which case I've got great news for you. So the team lock and load Brides of Christ, which has never been more relevant as they are going to be fighting demons. Captain Savage, that's his name, Captain Savage, of course brandishes the super shotgun, and it's all coming together. Just as intended, nature is healing. Deploying the bridge again, perfect matchup to the hatch, Daisy is then hit with the same corrupting feel that hit the facility, as she says, all systems normal, but stutters in the recording. Hmm... You know, I'm not so sure about that one. Opening the hatch, the captain then heads in first as they find the emergency power is still on, but at only 2% left. They cannot get the nuclear reactor fix they need to evacuate, which when they say nuclear, they're like, oh, nuclear, like it's a bad thing. 
Like, look, if humanity is really on the cusp of achieving nuclear fusion, like they have in this movie, which supposedly we are now, although it's been a pipe dream since the 70s, <laughs> I mean, we'll find out, we are absolutely going to turn to that for energy because there's virtually, like, no radioactive waste and so much energy is released. That's what our sun operates on. Then again, that's just what I read. I'm not a nuclear physicist, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. I'm just a biologist. So as Captain Savage poorly clears a room, leaving the left side completely exposed, they enter the hallway and discuss the reactor and how they need to get it working again. As they continue moving through, they find absolutely no one. No evidence anyone is left alive or evidence of like a battle. They then discuss who was all there and it is said that 90 personnel in total were stationed on Phobos which we will absolutely be counting, so get ready for that. They then find a chainsaw and nuclear waste as they begin moving through the area. Eventually, they find William Blaskovitz, and it's lore time! It is said that Doom Marine was actually killed on Phobos in Doom 2. However, he was transported to hell where he would rip and tear for over a millennia, like a Giga Chat, apparently. So this sergeant that they found, the Blaskovitz family from Wolfenstein, is said to be in the bloodline of the Doom Marine and eventually the Doom Slayer as well, because the Doom Marine is the Doom Slayer, so that's just a nod to that. Anyhow, so his head is completely ripped off, bummer bro, and also I break away just to, uh, back when Doom 2016 came out, I don't want to brag, but I suggested the Doom Marine was the same thing as the Doom Slayer because we hadn't actually known he'd been blessed yet, and everybody in the comments was like, you're so dumb, that's not who he is, he's a completely different person, and I was right, I was right. So not a time to lose one's head concerning this guy over here, well I guess uh, he'll never be the head of a major corporation. It's a shame he wasn't more headstrong. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Looking at the wall, Ancient Sumerian is written on said wall, and the guy who knows Ancient Sumerian apparently can't translate it. Nice. So, uh, they turn to the AI, because she needs to read it. Turns out, he's more confused as a mosquito in a mannequin factory when it comes to reading a language he's supposed to be fluent in. Mainly because the dialect of Sumerian does not actually appear to have originated from Earth, it just appears to look like Sumerian, so can't really blame him too much. So, Daisy goes on to say that, uh, basically it says we're reclaiming what is ours. Great times abound, shouldn't be a problem. So as the pilot continues to drink, it's clear Daisy is having more and more issues. The maps and the HUDs are becoming corrupted. The team is starting to crack already, like a bunch of unprofessional nerds. And heading to the plant room, I'm just gonna go ahead and say you never head to the plant room. It's where all the bad things go down. So as the team moves through, they spot something run by. They eventually find someone snacking on a manwich, where it kicks off an entire event. So, we have 90 personnel. Get ready for this. So, Blaskovitz is done. So, 89. And the dude getting eaten was 88. The attack begins as Master Translator over here gets his trachea almost immediately ripped out. Ouchies. Lee then drops one. So, 87. A team of survivors comes up showing three are still human, so that drops it potentially down to 84 enemies. Winslow gets grabbed and drops one. So, 83. Joan checks on Winslow, and they call in that one of them is gone. Lee then approaches the one that she took out, and as Joan takes the guy's badge, Winslow freaks out, questioning, Is that even human? Like, no duh, bro. It's wearing human clothes. It even has, like, a badge on it. Like, why are you so surprised right now? Of course, the former human does look a little strange to some degree, so let's go over its alterations and bodily deterioration and discuss on a cellular level why this is happening. So first, it's important to understand that this process is not immediate. Exposure to hell energy is something that I believe requires kind of a few things. First, your soul needs to be gone, allowing hell energy to replace that vacuum created within. Upon this being completed, it results in a second outcome, the deterioration of your meat suit over time, given the baseline energetic functionality changing. Remember, I may sound like a complete lunatic, but this is because I have to assume the energy of the human soul has downstream effects on the human body to create you and make you act like who you are. So by changing the energy, which is upstream from your physical body, downstream, this would have continued effects. It's sort of like, uh, you know, a nice clean stream and then somebody adding a sewage pipeline and it's like one day you're getting clean water and the next it's all turds. So when the original doctor who went through the portal was changed, we saw black liquid coming out of his eyes that was rather viscous. His iris color had changed, his lips were stained black from the material coming out of his mouth as well. We can assume this is like the blood that has entered such a deep state of becoming deoxygenated that its color has darkened to almost black coloring but it is likely rather viscous at this point as well, simply because the body would not be doing so great. This would have cascading consequences for the body now that oxygen is off the menu, boys. When the body runs out of oxygen, it will present in several different ways, but typically the skin will start to turn blue. We do not immediately see this with the doctor, even after he was placed in solitary confinement. However, given that we can see those altered in the plant room, the far-reaching implications are laid bare. 
Once turned into a former, all metabolic functions appear to cease. While the body is kept alive by hell energy, because that's going to be its fuel source, it would appear the skin is no longer able to keep up. And this may be for a multitude of reasons, but at the end of the movie, they mention how cellular regeneration is affected. And this may be because the energy actually received isn't enough. It is unknown how much hell energy, which the metabolism is based on, like is being provided as energy to the cell. And if in comparison to like the standard ATP cycle, this would even compare. But because of the skin's rapid turnover rate, it may be that the cells are just simply not receiving enough energy from hell energy to maintain their health. This is supported that if you take a look at the former humans in games, their skin is usually falling off, yet the main components such as structural and muscular are maintained. This seems like perhaps hell energy keeps the cell alive, as long as it doesn't need to undergo mitosis that much, but any rapidly dividing cells are not given enough energy to sustainably undergo that mitosis. This in turn leads to degradation of the body. The presentation of the scientists is going to result in blue skin and all hair on their bodies falling off, rendering them completely smooth. Their teeth will also start to fall out and their blood has essentially become like completely black and coagulated. And as we will see with uh, somebody later, it seems like hearts are ripped out more than anything, so that's going to completely stagnate the blood. Their life-sustaining functions have all but ceased, and this means if left to their own devices for long enough, the formers would most definitely have their skin slough away. This is noted as being the case in the unwilling variant of human. There is no skin and deep muscle tissue can be seen along with bone growth. If you look at other demons, it would also appear as though their bodies may have suffered the same fate as a layer of fascia is sucked to the muscle. It may be skin, but with humans, it most definitely appears to kind of be having some issues maintaining itself after exposure. But the question is, is it based on the overall goal of hell energy or is it just a happy little accident that the energy received to run the body isn't enough to maintain all functions? And we'll get there in a moment, but back to the fight. The former human that uh, Lee went to check on gets back up and starts attacking her as she double taps it once more. The scientists then run in yelling, I'm from the science team, and continue talking about the situation developing. Uh, she is then attacked, and she's also accounted for the numbers already, so don't worry about it. So, no need to count her again. They then take out the former, bringing up the potential enemies to 82. And at this point, the radios are screwed due to Daisy disrupting them. The full attack begins. So here we go. Lee drops another 81 and then 80. Captain makes 79. They now do the smart thing and spread out. Great plan, guys. Don't stick together at all. And Winslow and Jones start stacking bodies, dropping 178. Both drop two, so 76. And I know I have to count these because in reality, they are actually like... They almost put down the entire base by the end of this. They drop seven more before having to reload, bringing the number down to 69. Nice. As Winslow completely pansies out and then runs away saying he's too young to die. Bro, you signed up for this. So now he leaves Joan on her lonesome and she blows up two, 67, and then drops jumper 66. Mr. Minigun over here blows away another one, 65, and then two more, 63. As he talks about how, I'm your ultra nightmare, brother. Ah yes, a mode I've yet to complete, and you're not really Ultra Nightmare. Well, actually, just like Ultra Nightmare, that's about to go ultra wrong. So taking out another, 62, he then gets grabbed like a huge nerd and taken out himself, but the former then gets taken out, 61. Joan, running and gunning, then brings it down to 60 and then 59, then slices 58 and 57 before throwing a knife and taking out 56. She then chainsaws 55, 54, and 53, hell yeah, sister, and checks out the badge as one of them was Olivia Wilkes. I'm not 100% sure who this is to be perfectly honest, but this may be a reference to Olivia in Doom 2016, perhaps? Not sure. So Lee now gets stabbed. No, don't bleed out. You're so pretty. Haha. Ha. As Mr. Protector over there then takes out 52 before taking out 51 moments later. Winslow keeps running like a turbo douche as the former then gives chase on the ladder. Heading back to the scientist, old blue hair takes out 50 before he can take out Rance. And I heard the captain hit another off screen, so 49, and then a second one, 48. Winslow keeps running through the hallways saying he's not playing anymore. Bro, reload and turn around. Like you could, while you're running, you can reload, I feel like. Joan then saves his tail, taking out 47 and 46, leaving just 45 left to contend with. Joan then punches Winslow, which is deserved as they regroup. The captain continues sweeping as they find Brutridge on the ground still alive, meaning 44 personnel remain. Former 43 and 42 get taken out as they run down the hallways. Meeting up with Joan and Winslow, they now realize they lost the captain as he drops 41. 40 is then taken out quite easily, along with 39. And you have to ask yourself, why not regroup at this point and just finish the job? You have taken out two-thirds of the entire base. Oh, 38 is now gone, 37 and 36, then take a double barrel to the face as the captain gets grabbed. Using handhelds, he drops 35 and 34, and then slices 33 and spinal taps 32, ending those two as well. 
He then starts to get overwhelmed as he shoots the door, closing it so the former cannot go in with the rest of the team. Of course, that's what we like to call a nice choke point, so swing away, Meryl, why not? Let them run in and get mowed down, is all I'm saying. It seems like the best plan. So now the super shotgun is behind a locked door, of course. So Joan attacks her ex-boyfriend over this, and he finally says, well, we think we found alien life. Buttridge then comes in, talking about how they still do not understand what they found. Yeah, clearly. The pilot now calls out to Daisy, but she can't establish contact with Martian Command because she just doesn't feel like it. He decides that, well, we're going to go up and get a better signal, but Daisy says nobody's allowed to leave as she's been fully corrupted, so she says her name's not Daisy. The pilot is then attacked. They see humans become spacefaring. They hate him. Bertrand at this point is discussing the portal tech that they found because uh, the jig is up, the news is out. Uh, they found the demon. <laughs> they found the demon drawer. Basically, they need to find a planet outside the solar system to colonize. Which, you know, we don't want to get stuck in this solar system. So they found these teleporters that appear to originate somewhere else as the material they are made from are not from this solar system. They won't work unless hooked up to technology and they predate the pyramids, so whatever placed these here, new humanity would eventually develop the technology necessary to use them. They think the things in the portals were aliens, but the father on the station thinks they're straight up demons. And I agree, even if they aren't close enough, burn their Xeno hides. Also, Joan says, uh, there's an unknown enemy that we cannot even begin to comprehend. I mean, that's not entirely true. I've been counting the 90 personnel the whole time. Did you not read the mission brief? You guys almost like own the place at this point. So the reserve power is now at 1.09%, which ain't great. The father seems to be succumbing to his bite, which is rather interesting, actually. Like, why? It would appear to me that perhaps by direction of the hell energy, could an infection be produced along with it? I mean, fundamentally, if you think about it, the hell energy corrupts cells. Any bacteria a person has in their body would also be very likely corrupted. That and the black liquid, which is presumably blood, could also have any other material induced by exposure to hell energy within it. So this infection process may allow for the effects of hell energy to spread beyond the portal itself into the surrounding area, allowing for a plant to be more quickly taken over. Although it is possible that really this is just a cross-contamination event and anything on the other side of the portal, it being its own ecosystem, can have far-reaching consequences concerning infection to if anyone's bitten by a former. So moving through, they get the door open as the father mentions getting something to drink. Joan calls out to Morgan and then Daisy and says, will you open the door? Moving back into the ship, Daisy keeps asking Joan, oh, what are you looking for? Also, they still haven't cleared the ship and they just let people run around. I wouldn't let anybody wander off, but maybe that's just me. Dr. Stone then talks about the implications of finding Sumerian and then questions whether aliens brought the language to humanity and if the tech they left is specifically meant for us. Yeah, just like the mass relays in Mass Effect. We could use them, but they weren't really meant for our benefit. It's kind of like an angler fish's light. It's just uh, all teeth behind there. So Joan asks where Morgan went as Daisy says, oh, he's on the flight deck. But is he though? Looking around, she sees no one, but as she continues to check, she spots him torn up at the corner. Joan then asks what happened as Daisy responds, what will happen to her as well as Mr. Shadow Man creeps in the corner. So as the father gets his water, one of the demons shows up and just straight up tears into his spine. Ouchies. And Joan then starts getting attacked, as these things are just straight up imps. It fires a fireball at her, which I could appreciate, as I don't remember the actual Doom movie having fireballs. They were just basically monsters, as she dodges and loses sight of it. Rance then gets pulled up the ladder and gutted pretty much immediately as the imp attacks, but 556 appears to do very little to stop these things. Probably the bony coverings all over their body. Winslow once again runs away, a real hero that one. And we can see the imps, that the idea that their skin is lost is a characteristic that is fully on display. It's important to remember that demons appear to be a conquered species, some race that came into contact with the hell energy and then corrupted. At the core of a multicellular animal is the need to maintain an internal climate and salt concentration. If your body is exposed to the atmosphere, then you cannot maintain that climate and you will expire. Skin barriers help mitigate this issue. When looking at imps, they appear to have cracked plating, but their skin appears to be missing for the most part. Of course, there is something about the imps that should be noted, which we will also see later. These appear to be somewhat human. They are human size, appear to have human eye sockets, and their bones also are in the same configuration as a Homo sapiens. So it's important to remember this, as we will see a variation later that I believe that shows formers may progress into imps. So Joan approaches the hidey hole ladder, looking for the imp, and finds evidence of an attack. The father has been knocked down, and her team members have been despined. Veronica enters a room with Bertridge, and then goes to hide. The imp continues attacking Joan as it legit goes to steal her soul. Good lord, that was pretty cool. But the imp then gets a few shots before it can complete its attempt as Joan puts it down for good. The father took a fireball to the chest, basically ending him in the process rather quickly. So Blue Hair continues looking for Winslow as she gets attacked and almost desold as they fire into the imp. 
I'm not counting the imps because they are, or at least seem to originate from hell, or so it's suggested, and they are not a certified Earth classic as far as we can tell. Veronica then talks to Bertridge, but he can't remember anything after entering the portal. Oh really? That's interesting. So they all now have a nice meeting in the briefing room over what to do. They say that they should secure the ship and then wait for Mars to send help. That said, if the reactor is about to blow, it becomes apparent that they need to enter the portal to try to get to Earth before Phobos just completely uh, self-destructs. So remember, there are only about like 31 former humans left, but now that the imps have joined the party, might be a bit of an issue. Stone then tells Joan, Stone and Joan, anyways, if they use the portal, the base will absolutely be done as it will use the rest of the power draw. And this is why if you have a reactor, I don't know, maybe set up like solar panels as well or something, you know, redundant fail safes. What are those? We don't need those here. So heading back to the facility, they begin clearing hallways. They make it to the reactor and then fan out. Stone begins working on the reactor to restart it, breaking through though with his hacks. Bertridge starts talking to Joan like about setting a guy free who is not a happening dude with ratitude. Quite the opposite actually. He was known to terrorize people. You get the inference here. So. The doctor then starts complaining like a big baby about, My base is not a punishment for you. Uh, okay dude, it's like a moon with 90 other people. Well, 31 now. Not exactly a great place to grab a beer and hang out with the locals. Like, have you ever tried talking with scientists before? I hung out with a pre-med chemical engineer the other night and got a beer with her. My god, never again. <laughs> Even I am not equipped to deal with that level of intellect. Because, uh, there's usually social issues on the other side of that coin. Which, uh, now that I say that out loud, me dealing with that level of intellect makes me sound like a total tool, but at least I'm aware of it. But I couldn't keep up with the chemical engineer, like, never mind scientists working with portals. Also, she keeps calling me at like midnight and uh, it's getting a little strange. Yeah, send help. So Stone gets nuclear reactor assessed and realizes the circuit board is fried. Winslow tells Bertridge, that's enough. And he starts attacking the rest of the team and letting Joan know what the rest of the team thinks of her. Basically, just being a turbo douche. Stone then starts the reactor, don't look directly into that thing, as the facility gets powered back up. Bertridge then pulls a knife, taking out Veronica, but she's already been accounted for, so don't worry about her. Bertridge then seals the team in the room as the imps begin attacking. This armor is useless. Why do we even wear it? So they begin shooting at the imps as old blue hair gets annihilated. Somehow Joan with the handheld is able to take them out, even though their rifles wouldn't, and finally Winslow gets taken out as well. My god, that man survived way too long. Joan then headshots the imp, leaving just her, Stone, and Veronica. Of course, Veronica ain't doing so hot bleeding out over there. They are now trying to figure out why Bertridge would want to open the gates. He's corrupted. Y'all should know you're dealing with hell energy at this point, right? So Veronica gives them the yellow key card so they can finally go get the super health orb, as they realize there's a secret passage, and the key cards now allow for them to use it. They use Blaskovitz's key as, Yo, it's the BFG 9000, sick! So they grab that bad boy, as well as the plasma grenades, as Joan then says she screwed up letting the terrorizer get away, but that doesn't seem like treason. I don't know, mistakes happen, but uh, now they need to go after Buttridge. Basically everything I just said with that guy really doesn't matter. So as they walk, they discuss dates they went on. Ah, trauma bonding. I was trauma bonded once with someone. Wouldn't recommend it. However, that said, guaranteed to rekindle any long dead flame for at least a few months, just in a very unhealthy way. So at this point, Stone gets grabbed and dragged into the elevator by an imp as two former humans and an imp appear behind Joan. She straight up wastes a BFG on 30 and 29, imagine, before taking out the imp with a single shot. Hmm, needs more guts. The elevator opens up and Stone is nowhere to be found, but there's no blood either. Oh wait, no, it's on the lower level. Okay, so hold up, let me count. 10. There are 10 meat suits on the ground, indicating there's a maximum of 19 former humans potentially running around. Heading into the portal room, she finds Bertridge. An imp then enters the room as she takes it out, and Stone begins to attack her. Three bodies on the background as Bertridge walks down, putting the max number of formers at potentially 16. Bertridge starts talking about how Earth was theirs before it was ours. Yeah, nobody cares about that, you nerd. It's a human planet now. Get wrecked. Also, I just saw two more bodies behind Joan when she was fighting, so 14 potential formers left. Bertridge then opens the portal, and as he walks, I saw a third body apart from the initial two, so 13 formers are left. Basically, you own the base at this point. Also, I break away to discuss something here for a moment. How exactly did the demons lose Earth? How did they interact with ancient man and then just go, oopsies, we forgot where our portal was, awoo? The only conceivable thing I can imagine is that the demons were not demons prior and instead lost their planet upon finding hell energy and the species they were prior was corrupted much like humanity is about to be, which we will find evidence of this momentarily. So as Joan uh, fights Stone and then takes him out, she gets smacked down by Bertridge as he grabs the force multiplier. She's able to get the handheld away from him and fires a shot into him. Grabbing the key card, she realizes old Lord Bertridge is uh, 
Well, he's been gone the whole time. He's just having his meat suit piloted. This must be the earliest effects, which again shows why the skin isn't surviving too well. No blood is being pumped around the body, so hell energy is keeping the core alive. The outer areas of the body are left to fall away. He then force pushes her into the portal as she wakes up underwater. She begins swimming upwards and emerges on some sort of planet. Looking around, well, it ain't Earth, but there are tendrils all over the surface and at least the atmosphere is breathable. As she moves out, things begin melting and bubbling towards her. She starts having flashbacks to the imps and realizes this is where they have been coming from as they move in. A creature begins speaking Sumerian at her as it mentions humans and how pathetic we are and blah blah blah. Bro, listen, you're talking a lot of smack considering you're in BFG range. And luckily, the Lord is with her considering she's wearing a cross, so it's time to go completely full-on protection paladin mode and start smiting these heathens. As they move in, she grabs BFG and starts taking out the creatures before noping out of there, finding a portal opening behind her. Throwing the plasma grenade, she literally plasma grenade jumps and enters the portal emerging at Earth. Blowing up the Hell Lord, again, we have to wonder, is that like the traditional form of demons or is this just a species altering other species to behave and appear like them? Even to this point, was the species just corrupted as well, considering at some point they seem to use portals and share information such as ancient Sumerian with other animals, in this case specifically Homo sapiens? Were they corrupted like many other planets before them, or are they the original one? And this is all based on the usage of portal technology where they inadvertently let Hell Energy be released on their planet as well. So something to note here is the generalized idea that imps on Phobos are actually progressed former humans. Given their size and leftover characteristics in comparison to the imps on the planet that Joan goes to, this is a dead giveaway given their stark differences. As the Hell Energy seeps deeper into the body of a human, it's clear all the skin will fall away, and likely with others as well. What is left, at least with human imps, is this dark wet covering as all their humanity is lost. However, their physical bone structure, leftover human traits, and general Homo sapiens morphological characteristics would definitely suggest that this is a human who has progressed to imp status. This means that Hell Energy would be altering the body with a purpose towards specific growth patterns. This may indicate that potentially an original species that came into contact with the energy, or may have been the initial corruptors of an energy that they found, or even created the energy, appeared to be the end point for all species. Although genetically the body would have to be altered in such a capacity to create this thing that it probably wouldn't even really read genetically as human anymore. So the scientists then show her cellular regeneration does not appear to be showing issues, and this statement seems to support the fact that Hell Energy does not give the body enough energy to completely regenerate, but instead is just pushing the body to alter and change towards an imp. Joan then tells him to close the gates now as they inject her with a chill pill so that she'll actually just chill out as the demons begin emerging, indicating, well, that's a bit of an issue, isn't it? So at this point, it is alleged she's the Doom Marine, and now there's nothing before her but ripping and tearing until it is done. This demonic outbreak appears to be slightly different from what we have normally seen. This almost appears like an infection of sorts, altering the native species to become more like what has already turned. But the question is though, does it follow the maker's path in terms of why it all began, or is this something different entirely? I would say we would need a second movie to clear up a lot of these questions, but the reality is, I think Universal Studios was on the cusp of losing rights to Doom at this point, so they made this real quick, and since then, I believe it's changed hands. So I severely doubt any new information will come to light. But that's why I'm here, to be a total crackhead about it. I believe it's a combination of hell energy, your missing soul, and an infection. The ultimate goal is to subjugate an entire species and turn them into imps, which are compatible with the founding species of the hell energy. Once this is accomplished, they will move on to the next world, and I do not believe the hell lord or the imps of that planet are actually the founding species, but simply a turned species that may have discovered hell energy shortly after their interaction with man, probably because they were using portal technology. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be awesome of you, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my merch, Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links to Roanoke Tales in the description, where we talked about, if I remember correctly, Cicada 3301, I believe it was called. Not 3301, I guess it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's pretty interesting as we're supposed to give another hint in 2024 what that even is. So if you want to catch up on, you know, what that is, you can go watch it on Rono Tales. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, you thank you to our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer. Thank you, my man. Next up, I'd like to thank our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations of B-grade horror movies, Dakota 23, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in a Trench Coat. Thank you guys as well. And the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate y'all's support. You're absolute ballers. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one. Don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan the QR code to get insane bonuses for new players.